This is Brian Putt. Today I'd like to talk to you about using a, a Markov matrix and doing a probabilistic analysis to make a forecast. Most of the time Markov matrices are used and they come up with expected values, but in this case we want to be able to calculate a confidence interval around our forecast. Let's first review what is a Markov matrix. In a Markov matrix, we need to specify states. So in this case, I've got three states, state 1, 2, and 3. And you can see that if you're in state 1, you can move to state 2, or if state 1 can move to state 3, and similar for state 2 can move to state 1, or to state 3, and state 3 can move to either state 1 or state 2. Now to complete the matrix, we need to have some probabilities. So in this case, we're going to assume that 81% of the time, if you're in state 1, you're going to stay in state 1. And there's an 18% chance that you'll move from state 1 to state 2, and a 1% chance you'll move from state 1 to state 3. The total of the 81, 18, and 1 is equal to 100%. Similarly for state 2, 77% chance of staying there, uh, a 17% chance of moving back to state 1, and a 6% chance of moving to state 3 and similar for state 3. These, ma these probabilities are typically represented in a matrix similar to this. Now, what if we had 27 things or people each following this transition matrix over a 10-year period? So every period they go through this transition matrix and they can go from state 1 to state 2 to state 3, then they can move back to state 1, they can move back to state 3, and, they, and so every period, each one of these things is moving independently following this Markov matrix. So let's think about this as being house mortgages. Some are struggling, and they're in state one. Some are delinquent, and they're in state two. And some are in default, and they're in state three. Now what we want to know is how many houses would be in each state after 10 years, and we want to understand what the confidence interval is around them. We've got the P10, and we've got the P90, and the expected value. So let's go look at the model and see how we calculate this. As shown here, down here is the graphics we started with, showing the numbers state 1, 2, and 3, and the confidence interval around each of those. So here's the model. At the top, we specify the number of homes in the initial states. So in state 1, there's 20 and 7 in state 2 and none in state 3. Over here, we specified the Martov matrix that we showed you before. And we're going to do a sensitivity using this table here. So this is actually the Markov matrix used in the model. I've summarized the probabilistic results here. Let's come back to that later. And now I specified periods. And the model is actually set up to do like 27 periods, but let's assume that we're just looking at the ten, first 10. We start off in state 1 with 20 homes. And then we're going to sample using 81%, this 81%, 17 of those. Now this is being done with a binomial distribution. So what happens is, we're asking if I have 20 things and there's an 81% chance of, of them being successful of staying where they are, given a random number, which we specify over here, this 0.67, how many remain in state one? And the answer is 17. So now the question becomes, we started off with 20, and 17 of those stayed in state 1. That means there's 3 left over. So here is the 3 that are left over. And now I want to ask the question, given the remaining probability, what's the remaining probability? Well, we used up 81%, so if we have a total of 18 plus 1, or 19%. And 18 divided by 19 is 97.4%. You can see that here. Okay. So using 94.7%, of the three remaining, how many 
um, move from state 1 to state 2? And the answer is 2. There's a separate random number used for that one. And then finally, in state 3, those moving from 1 to 3 have to be the balance. So they didn't, if they didn't stay in state 1 and they didn't go to state 2, they had to go to state 3. We're going to do the same process for those that are in state 2 to start with, which we know are 7. And in this case, first case, it samples 2, which leaves a total of 5. And of that 5, 100% of them stay in state 2, and none move to state 3. Down here on this particular iteration, let's look at that one. In this particular iteration, there were 11 homes in state 2 to start with. We moved there going through these multiple periods. And we sampled only one of them using 17% went from state 2 to state 1. So then, I started off with 11, 1 went to state 1, so now there's 10. Of those 10, 9 went to state 2, which meant one of them went to state 3. So now I have something in state 3 on this particular trial. We're going to run 1,000 of these trials. So I've got 10 periods, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 random numbers for each period. And then I'm going to run 1,000 of those. And that gives us the results over here. This shows the number of homes in, uh, at the beginning of the period, uh, at the end of the period, excuse me. Period 0 started off with 20 and 7 and 0. And after one period, we now have 19, 7, and 1. At the end of 10 periods, we have 16, 10, and 1. We can use SIP math tools here and look at a different trial. So that was trial 16. If I go to trial 17, you're going to see all these numbers change. Eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. Now these represent spark lines, which are the distributions. I can then capture those by year, by period. So this is period one to period ten for state one, and then I've simply plotted those over here. Let's close this. So now the question is. Oh, so first of all, let's record uh, the EV values here. That's 11.7, 11, 11, and 4.2. And those are the average values in period 10. We've recorded those over here. So now let's ask the question. We'll just erase this for the time being. What if rather than once you went into foreclosure, this is foreclosure here in state three, you never got out. So in other words, this is like a capture state. And oftentimes Markov matrices will have that. And the question was, how long does it take uh, typically for everything to get into that, that captured state? So we can do that. This is, this is sensitivity of 5%. So if I came over here and did a minus one here and a minus two here, and this has to balance, so I'll do a three. So now you can see what's happened to my Markov, is if it gets into state three, it always stays in state three. That's what that 100% means. So now what happened? So let's record that over here as values. So the expected number in state 1 went from 4.2 to 7.2 when I had a 100% chance of remaining in state 3. So you can see how I can do sensitivity analysis just using this little uh, table here. And it's quite easy to do. 
And we could also come down here and look at these graphics as well. So I think that's what I wanted to show you today. Oh, I guess there is a dashboard over here I might mention in this particular uh, model where you could um, you can quickly take a quick look at what's going on here. So I hope you found this video helpful. And if you'd like a copy of the model, you can uh, send me an email and I'll send it to you. If you're interested in learning more about SIPMath, you can go to www.probabilitymanagement.org. And you can download the SIPMath toolbar over here at Tools. You can download either the PC version or the Mac version. Thank you for watching the video.